welcome to this episode of Displaying Our Dysfunction. My name is Grindhead Jim, and today I'm joined by Boba Hicks and Mr. Jim Largo of Largo's Lair. Um, we are going to be discussing collection and the feelings surrounding a collection and how the hobby itself can become a lot of different things depending upon your demeanor at any given time. Uh I know that's very vague, but that's okay. It's a big subject. How are you two gentlemen doing? I'm, good, I'm swell. I'm good. Yeah. Glad to hear it. So um, I will start by, by telling a tale that many people that have been watching this channel and you two certainly know, which is when I started collecting in 2021, I was in a, I literally lived in a hotel room. I had no space and there was a constant struggle just to keep toys somewhat organized, keep them in a place where I'm not going to knock them over or damage them. And, you know, display was the furthest thing from my mind because I was constantly like, Hey, I'm going to get into a place where I can display them. And then it took me two years to get to, get to that place. Uh, and in the meantime, you, you have small kinds of incremental improvements and you have different types of storage and stuff like that. Then I finally get here in this apartment uh, in April of 2023, so a little over a year and a half ago. And, you know, the, the crass arrogance of my brain said, ah, I'll have all the toys up and moving within a couple days. I even had it in my head. I was going to have it done in one day. I don't know how the hell I thought that was even possible. Took me a couple months just to get the shelving up and to get the toys onto the shelf that were just in the room, let alone the ones that were stored. And now, you know, over a year later from that, I have finally, in earnest, really got the process going when it comes to taking toys out of packages, getting displays moving in certain directions and so forth. And I am, while I am finding some peace in it, it's less about the enjoyment of that process, but rather the result. So I'm still not quite to that serene place I want to be. Um, but I will say that the pressure of feeling like I, I haven't done something or that I need to do something. In other words, the, the, the stress of collecting has, is starting to subside. Um, and I find that in contrast to the two of you so um and i'll do my perspective briefly and i'll have each of you expand um mark you have what i would think is every toy collector's goal when it comes to your toy room in as much as you have a specific room you have the displays set up it, that in a way that fit that room very well um, you know what you have, you took the time, you measured twice, cut once, and then as things come in, you kind of readjust and you just, you have a room, you can just walk in, sit down, enjoy. And when new stuff comes in, you know, that just, you then will then integrate that into the collection. You don't seem to have a tremendous backlog of stuff. Um, contrast that with Mr. Largo here. And you have, you had to restart your collection a bit late and you already had a pretty well curated collection when we met in 21 uh, but then other toy lines were coming out and your interests kind of changed a little bit so there's been kind of a you're right smack in the middle between where i was and where he is so the question that i want to pose to you both is at it mo at its most frantic what were the emotions that you were running as you were building towards a room that you could display a collection in? And Mark, I'll start with you. We'll move on to then you, Jim. Well, for me, it was a real feeling of excitement because it was happening at the same time I just moved into this house that I'm living in. Like I bought the house, so it was a big deal just like owning my own house this is the only house i've ever owned like so i was like super just stoked to be in and there was a lot of stuff going on obviously because we're half demolishing the house to get it set up for for everything else you need just to live but any spare moment i could get i was in this room i was building shelves i was building furniture i was just 
mapping out in my mind everything I wanted. I was ripping out old wardrobes and pulling off old doors just because I just wanted it. I knew I wanted like glass cabinet set up and just I just a lot of things in my mind that I wanted and yeah, like so for initial feelings, it was pure excitement, adrenaline, especially like because it, it took, you know, a long time, really, like it didn't happen overnight because, you know, you're paying for a million other things to do at your house that you've just moved into. And the cabinets, you know, they add up, you know, <laughs> you know, it was like, I think it was like 200 quid a pop for, for each one, you know, we have to save up for them, putting them together. And yeah, it just took its time, but you know, it was just a great feeling. It always felt like you're just getting this little bit closer, little bit closer, little bit closer to, to what you want. But I think for me, like not totally removed from your situation, Jim, but I was in a situation where I was living in a in a somewhat confined space. Like I was still uh, living in my, my family house, like my childhood home. I had a collection of stuff in tubs and storage that I couldn't display. I couldn't do anything with. Like I had a wall of shelves, like bookshelves in my bedroom, but that's about it. Like it was a tiny little room in a in a bungalow. Like you're not gonna you're not gonna do much with that. So you know, it was a big deal for me to be able to actually uproot this stuff and really, you know, peacock it, you know, put it on display. Because for years, you know, you were sitting on things and you're only really imagining what it would look like when you actually took it out of its box or did something with it and especially in the case of the vintage stuff like i've been picking up vintage transformers for years you know the the package would arrive you'd look at it make sure everything was okay and it's like okay into a box into storage and see you maybe never i don't know because you know it, that was just the situation i was in so to be finally in a position where you could actually put this stuff out and appreciate it and just look at it and admire it that, that just felt great felt amazing Okay, so in your position, to, to summarize, you've been building the collection, like I said, very parallel to me, uh, had a small display, moving to the place, but you decided, you opted to take your time and relish the process, um, and partially because it was by necessity, right? Like, you didn't have all the shelves and everything, whereas I came in. And I already had the shelves. I already had the place measured. I, so I thought I couldn't trust their measurements. Like they said, it was X amount long. And so I have, that's why I have this one, you know, shelf, which is whatever. Uh, but I, I had it in my head that I would just be able to just go. Bum, 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 bum. Didn't happen that way, obviously. Um, but I, 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 I like the, I like the idea of knowing that like you kind of taking it in that direction because you could. And I have a theory about that I'm going to come back to. So, Jim, uh, you get to Guatemala. You decide to start your collection up again, which... So I, my, my first question with that was, was it always going to be the case that you were going to start collecting again as soon as you got there? Or what, what prompted that? And then tell me about the process of picking this room and beginning that process. Tell me about that. And what were your feeling at the time? Uh... Originally, I, I kind of started my expat journey with a minimalist mindset, rucksack, small uh, bag, and all my possessions were, you know, what I can carry and, and go. And I was planning on doing a bit more travel and exploring. I did a bit of that. I'd never owned a home like, uh, like Mark. I'd uh, just always, you know, rented and, and so the goal of buying my first house, because obviously real estate's a lot more affordable here in Guatemala, that was that was definitely a priority. So in the back of my head, there was the idea that eventually I'd create an artist studio or a, a, an office space, something that would be reflective of, you know, getting the creative juices flowing. For me, it's it's about the space. You know, when you talk to somebody, whether they're you know, the, their art form is painting or sculpture or what have you. Their creative space is very spiritual. It's got to be, you know, certain things have to be in a certain way or certain colors. Whatever gets your creation going. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So, I think it applies to music as well. You know, having been sure. a musician, I can kind of trace 
for example, if you look at like over the course of four albums that recorded with the band Cardiac Arrest, you look at the first one, the second one, the third one, and the fourth one, and they were all written in different environments at different times. And it's reflect where you were when you were writing the songs and rehearsing the songs reflects how they then get recorded. So I think an artist studio, uh, any kind of creative endeavor, a hobby, like what you surround yourself with directly influences your demeanor when you're in the space for sure. So if you had dogs playing poker versus velvet Elvis, that album could have been completely different. True. It's true. hundred percent true. And, you know, size matters too. Most people here in Guatemala are very diminutive. They're kind of short. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things I did is, is I found a, a good spiritualist to kind of help me figure out the feng shui. Uh, unfortunately, she got into a spot of trouble with the law, ended up running off. So now she is a small medium at large. So <laughs> long way around the bend for a dead joke. Uh, yeah, no, I like that. Seriously though. Uh, no matter where I've lived, I've always wanted to have a creative space, whatever that means to me, whether it's, you know, a cheesy poster of something that gets the nostalgia of juices flowing or something that helps with creative writing. Uh, for me, it's, it's iconography. The, the stuff we surround ourselves with in our happy space, it, it kind of like is a mirror for that, that creative thing. So I keep coming back to that. That was the goal of, of, of Largo's Lair was to create that space. Okay. So when that process began, um, and let's kind of take away the building out of the space itself to a certain degree, because once it's done, then you can kind of start filling in things. Were you experiencing something similar to what Mark was, where um, you were just excited to, to get moving? And how far along into your collection, recollection, so to speak, recollection uh -huh. were you when this the, the room was more or less ready to go when i uh when i left america i i came with with only two toys that i kept out of my previous collection uh, a tardis and a a superman uh figuring because those were kind of like my two go-to's and I was kind of leery about getting back into it, especially dealing with the fact that there's no local toy shops. Everything had to be done, you know, online or, or through shopping distance wise. Um, it, I, it, didn't, it wasn't conscious. It was kind of one of those things where as we were refurbishing the house and I had picked my office and started putting the thing together, you know, it was like, well, I've got this blank canvas. What am I going to put in here? Especially coming from a very minimalist state of, I don't want stuff anymore to, okay, now I have a home and it's empty and it needs something. So I picked up little pieces here and there. Not, I wasn't really focused on vintage. Uh, I love a lot of vintage toys, but again, difficulty of picking stuff up. I didn't want to have to deal with Evil Bay um, I looked around at some of the local markets just to see what was there. Not much. Um, you know, a lot of it was knockoff stuff from, from China or little tchotchkes for tourists, but nothing that really fit my, you know, sci-fi slash superhero kind of thing. A couple Lucha Libre, which I kind of got into, but that's another story. That's another rabbit hole. You're right. Um, so it just kind of creeped up on me as, as we were putting the house together, um, I'd find little pieces here and there online and, and just start picking up some things. And then once I had a few pieces that didn't, it, it, I didn't really have a collection uh, uh, per se. It was more of an eclectic, you know, bits and pieces of, Ooh, that shiny squirrel. And then trying to figure out how to put that together in something that was cohesive. Okay. So initially it was exciting. Yeah. And so my follow-up question to you, because I kind of want to bring us into a, the same place. Um, at what point did you realize this was becoming a collection? Hmm. Me or Mark? You, because he already oh. had his. We've covered all that shit for him. 
Uh, probably when I started, like with Mark, looking at shelving. You know, it's like, am I going to go glass display? Am I going to go with just traditional shelves? When you're looking at what am I going to frame this in? And then how do I set that frame? Because for me, when I look at the shelves, it's like I don't want to just cram stuff on a shelf like a bookcase. It's more of each shelf is like a it's a picture. It's a little snapshot of something. Sure. So that's when it started becoming a collection, I think. Okay. So for me, I, I think that um, listening to both of your stories, it, it kind of feels like the timing of things makes a big difference, right? Um, if I had to like point at one factor between the three of us that is different is that when I arrived in this space with the shelves that were set to fit this area, you know, with a clear game plan of what I wanted to do, but never having displayed toys in this way before and having no experience with it, just everything was conceptual. The key difference is that I also had the privileged burden of also doing a live show every single week out of this room. You were burdened with glorious purpose. Correct. It's correct. You know, to quote Loki. Um, I, it really felt like that. And for two months... You know, it was every every week come on the show and say, yeah, I know nothing's different. Sorry, shit happens, blah, blah, blah. And then finally the shelves get up there. And then just for the sake of getting the toys out of the corner and create room to work, you just start putting stuff up. And for, you know, a year, that was my display. It was just a menagerie of the colorful boxes. And then as stuff came in, you move stuff around just with what's there. Never mind the stack of bins that are still largely untouched in my closet, which is, is to a certain degree still the case. I'm now moving forward. I felt pressure because I wanted the display to look good on camera. And hmm. my personal enjoyment of the display was outweighed by everyone else being able to see it. Like, that's part of why the room is laid out the way it is, say. If I didn't care about that, this room would be totally different. Totally different. You know, the desk would be over there, and then toys would be all the way along these walls, this wall, there'd be something in the center of the room, shit like that. You know, but for this to function, I this was built as a YouTube studio that happened to double as a office for work, triple, uh, as a toy display. Uh, so like the the bare bones functionality of the room had to be very different from what a traditional toy room will be. And as I continue to pine towards finding a place that will house all of our stuff and my family for the decades to come, hopefully, um, I have decided that it's like, well, I don't, that my priority is going to be the joy of it and the hobby and just displaying, displaying it the way I want. And I'll worry about how to capture it on camera after the fact. So I think that's a big difference. Um, let's, and both of you have since gone on camera dozens, scores of times for other shows, shows of your own, what have you. Um, has that in any way influenced how you display things now in an, if so or not, why? And I'll start with, with, with Mark. I'm not sure if it has influenced how I display the stuff currently, but it definitely, uh, kind of sprung me into action when it comes to keeping the place tidy because I just, you know, I don't know, glass cabinets, sometimes your reasoning for, for picking them up is you think, oh, I won't have to clean the stuff as much, you know, because it's behind glass and once it's in there, I keep it clean, it's fine, but stuff actually nearly looks worse, man. You've got 
you can see dust on the glass, you can see fingerprints, and it actually drives you a little bit insane over time. And it gets to the point where you you want to keep everything um, clean and shiny, but it does get a little bit monotonous taking the taking the toys out, cleaning underneath them, putting them back in. Oh, one fell over. Oh, now the rest have fallen over. <laughs> Right, like that first world problem. Is, though. Oh, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, folks at home, listen. If you're watching this, you're watching it because you have a collection or you aspire to have a collection that you can display in similar ways, and it's something we find joyous. But at the end of the day, it's not putting food on the table for any of us, and it is meant to be a hobby. We're not going to sit here and, and be. Oh, oh there are bigger problems in the world and for each of us personally, I'm sure. So do not think of this as, as, as humble bragging in motion because it's not. Um, so Lar Largo, same question there, buddy, because I, I, I know the answer to this, but I want to hear you say it. Uh, camera angles are your best friend. If you keep the camera where the chaos is not, people don't realize just how messy your room is. Because over here is just a bloody mess. But this part's okay. I mean, you can see a little bit of it back here because I'm right. reorganizing. But yeah, when I started doing the uh, YouTubes, I, I wanted to kind of have a thematic background. I didn't want to do green screen, you know, like Chad. Chad's that's all green screen. He doesn't really have any toys. Everybody knows that. <laughs> um, no, I, I put up a couple of shelves. I wanted to make sure I had a spot for a TARDIS. And, uh, you know, these kind of rotate. So on the mood or the theme or whatever we're talking about, I've got a couple of spots where I can put, you know, particular toys that are topical for whatever we're talking about or a particular season or what have you. Beyond that, everything else pretty much stayed the the. The same way I normally do my shelving, which is, you know, like I said, I pick a theme. I try to put a collection together that fits that shelf. So each shelf is kind of like its own little world. Gotcha. So the collection room itself more or less stayed the same, except for the corner from which you broadcast. And yeah. And then you kind of curated behind you. And then that rotates based upon theme. Now, because presumably many of the toys you would bring in for that behind you display on a temporary basis existed on other shelves. How much chaos did that introduce? <laughs> <laughs> Lots. <laughs> okay. But it did give me a good excuse to do a bit of dusting. Like, like Mark said, it, it, it's a never ending thing. By the time you finish dusting and cleaning one area, then you start over, you know, but well, yeah, it's gotten to the point where at some point in the last few weeks, Lauren and I, she was the one that brought it up. Like looking into the possibility of adding a whole house air purification system to the house to 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 kind of not you can't eliminate dust. Be sure as hell can minimize it with something like that. And I looked into it, and the cost it's basically it's like putting a separate air conditioning system into your house cost wise. Um, and it's something that I'm seriously considering. It's like, well, if I don't have to dust as much, right? Like, let's yeah. Go. I've I've got three furry dogs, a multitude of geckos that come and go, uh, all of the other, you know, wildlife of a rainforest is trying to reclaim, you know, civilization. There's always something here that, that's trying to uh, either eat or defecate on my collection. So it's sure. it's a challenge for sure. Yeah. yeah, I thought about getting one of those, at least a, one of the air filters oh, you just put in the room. Yeah, yeah. just to try it. So it's on my list. I, I will say that having been around them in the past, you will notice a difference in each room that has or does not have one. Uh, so investing in one in here is certainly something I've thought about, um, but I'm not there yet. Mark, have you ever considered something like that? I actually have, and I'm kind of at the moment riling a couple of smaller model um, one, nothing, nothing too intricate, but in the area of the house uh, where my cats take up most of the space, their living quarters, I have noticed a difference just in general, you know, less pet dander, less dust. Um, bear in mind, I live right next door to a, to a farm as well. So yeah, like Largo, I've got 
all sorts being dragged in and out of the house all the time so it does get pretty pretty dusty and gritty and yeah i have i have noticed i've definitely noticed it's not like a major improvement but i imagine if you were to invest the money in a in a decent system you could probably accomplish something like you said though you will never totally eliminate dust you will always have to do some yeah. cleaning um you know unless you're living in like you know uh a decontamination lab or something like that you know i just oh, but you do I've you do it. have the advantage of being in the old country if you just leave out you know some porridge can't you get the wee folk to come in and do a bit of dusting for you don't fuck with the wee folk man you know <laughs> I, i'll come downstairs the next day and uh, my collection will just be gone you know just empty don't. cabinets you know you'll see all the dust yeah. marks on the walls and where they pulled off the frame pictures and stuff it's like <laughs> yeah don't be inviting those fuckers into your house, man. So, you know, obviously, every display is in a is in a state of flux, um, unless you actively stop collecting and you're like, "That's the pose forever." And I, I would hasten to add that I don't think any collection ever, any display is ever truly done. Because every single day that I'm in here, even if I don't open anything, which that's the current state I'm in. I'm in the state of opening things, disposing of the packaging, and then re replacing the thing on the shelf. Yeah, I love yeah. your Jeng Jenga Tower of Marvel Legends in the background. It's like just oh, yeah. one, one yeah. push. <laughs> yeah, I ask Jasper about that. <laughs> uh man and, and as a side note like there's things are in a state of flux in the sense of like every new variable presents a new challenge right so i had this uh comeback slash rebranding show uh about a month ago or so and thank you to all that are enjoying the new version of the show so far um and thank you for the support because enough money was made during that stream that I could afford acrylic panels for the bottom shelves of the entire display. Nice. And, and it's, it's like the cost is about the same if I went for a full panel for each shelf or if I went with one big enough to do like three or four panels on each shelf. The cost is about the same. And I thought, well, I'd rather have separate panels. It makes more sense. And plus, I can do it in increments. So for about $100 US, give or take, I can outfit all of the sh bottom shelves. Why just the bottom shelves, you may ask? Well, one, you have to start somewhere. And two, again, my cat Jasper, because every time he walks it, he runs in here. He's either crawling up the back of this chair, which he's totally allowed to do, or he goes straight for the shelf down here that's open and knocks over everything on that shelf, <laughs> goes behind, and then tries to crawl through my, my big dinosaurs over here, which you can no longer see in the camera angle. And he just kind of, and then he gets stuck because I've moved stuff. There's more boxes. He's like, Ugh. one time he got back there two days ago and his head sticks out and he's like, Ugh. like, what do I do? I'm like, well, go back the way you came. It's already knocked down. You can't make it worse. <laughs> and then he kind of thought and actually did that. And then he's like, I'm leaving. And he left the room on his own volitions, which is yeah, the, the dog done that. The dogs have cleaned this table. Uh, I use it sometimes when I'm doing videos and I used to put storage underneath, but now mm -hmm. I actually have a, um, a little carpet and that's become like the dog's den. So I'll see a snout sticking out, kind of watching what I'm doing. I have to watch sometimes cause I'll close the door when I leave. I have to make sure all the dogs are out cause they don't make any noise. Yes. They just kind of veg. Yes. And on top of the fact that I have all the toys in here, I also have all my CDs in here. And I have this computer, which, I, again, I can't show it on camera, but it's a massive two-desk system, four monitors, the lights are up here, the computer's over here, wires just mating down underneath. Cable management. Cable management. It started <sighs> good. And then, you know, so the, the, the lie that I tell myself is that when it does come time to set up permanently in 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 the new house that we eventually procure but i will take my time i'll get everything out make sure i've got all the cables for every single piece like i'll catalog it before i go that's what i say i'll do and then when i get there 
I'll, I'll cable manage my way into bliss. Um, so far, um, I believe that lie. Uh, now, do you I guys, know. and this, this is for both of you, do you find, as I do, that you have the issue of uh, Kipple? Kipple is something, I think Philip K. Dick used that term in uh, um, one of his stories. But basically, Kipple is that thing of little accessories and bits that just accumulate. You don't remember where they came from, and they multiply like tribbles. They're just there. So every time you yeah. try to organize, you have the random coffee cup and pens and things that just take up space. So it's like, I need to clear space so I can organize stuff, but all the spaces are full. If there's a flat surface, some, something will be there. And I don't remember how sure. it got there. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Mark? No, a hundred percent. Yeah. There's always stuff. It's just, it's your, it's your general life things that just seem to just always turn up in random places. And like, where did the stack of like, un, or like, you know, I stack at ease in the corner, that's for sure. And, you know, like all this stuff just like, yeah, it accumulates. It doesn't, it feels like it takes no time, you know. One yes. day it's just there. It's like, oh, there's a pyramid of Coke cans. Now. I should probably yeah. do some of this stuff. When uh, I got the 3D printer and I was printing at the highest uh, volume that I have to date, and I, I, Again, it's kind of now it's like, well, I would love to sit down and take a day and recalibrate the printer, but now it's covered. It's surrounded in boxes. I can't get to it. Um, but that created its own little, you know, pile of schmutz. So, like, on this side of my desk now, for a while, there was a stack of partially used folded over paper towels for when I would spray... Uh -oh. the, the the bed with with alcohol to wipe it down and I just set the paper towel down because there's no dirt on it and the alcohol evaporates you see and then invariably something else would get stacked on top of that piece of paper towel and rather than grab the other one I'd get another one and then now you would have like paper towel something paper towel something paper <laughs> towel something like this sandwich of failure <laughs> And a, like it's a glue stick there because after you clean it, you put glue stick down for the next print and off you go. That and would like, be a great name for a band, Sandwich of Failure. Yeah, I mean, I could do that. I have this musical project that I'm eventually going to start called Kaiju Vomit, which is just all nice. incidental songs that I write in the moment because I've written, I write like six songs a day and I sing them to, to Lauren. And if I could just sit down and have a keyboard and go do, 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 and just knock it out, like my Spotify would be booming. But either or that. I also, on this side, have placed things to remind me of certain things. For example, yesterday, you and I are having a discussion, Jim. And I look over, and there is a Superman and a Batman that I've been meaning to send you for <laughs> almost two years. And then also behind that is a Batman I've been meaning to send to Scuba Pete for the same amount of time alongside this copy of Near Dark that I've been meaning to send to Mark for about a year as well. It's right here. I can just, oh, you know. That reminds me. I tell me. myself about these things is that oh, I'll send them with other stuff. And then that I, I don't I don't have it handy for for uh, the folks at home. But I, I yes, uh, I, it, as many of you know, I've been having a shipping kerfuffle. So I, all my stuff is backlogged in sitting in Florida. But I am now the proud owner of a Game Chasers signed copy of the Blu-ray. Finally got it. So I don't have mine yet. What? How did I get I one before you? Copy. So That's I have it. Because I paid for it before I was cast in the movie. And I was cast in the movie. So I should have two copies. I have zero copies. Really, <laughs> if you're watching this, where's my goddamn Blu-ray, bub? I, I'm betting it's somewhere behind Melvor's couch. It's a guess. Um, you know, maybe he's holding them hostage because of the bags. Maybe Billy holds a grudge because of that. You know, the irony, of course, would be that what if he brought it to Rachel Palooza this year and then I didn't show up? And he's like, well, damn. Exactly. You know, you know but eh, whatever. Um, <laughs> it's a whole thing. So, you know, everyone has their shall we call it a controlled squalor in, in your workspace. I think that's that's unavoidable to a certain degree. Um, and things change. And, and the most, as a collector, the most obvious part of change is when new things arrive. 
for the longest time when new things would arrive, I would, you know, find a space on the shelf when there was space on the shelves to be found. And then when I ran out of that, as you guys recall, it was just a pile. And then the pile stacked up about two shelves high, and then it started coming this way. And that came to a head when Eternia arrived, and after two months of, like, I guess I should put it in, the, in that room. Because I was scared to death that what was going to happen to it in the kitchen. I don't know why, but I did. And then it got worse, and it got worse. And then finally I was like, I'm, I'm done. And then you just rapidly start doing stuff. Um, but even now, when new stuff arrives, even though I'm not, I'm still in this chaos, uh, what I have started to do in the last several months, when something arrives, rather than getting it out of a shipping box and putting it in here in like a laundry basket or something, now I basically will go, okay, if this is something I'm going to open, I'm going to open it right here in the living room. And then allow the anxiety of the dog or the cat knocking it over to get it into the room within a couple days and put it somewhere. <laughs> and that somewhere usually was right here on this part of the desk. I would just have like, oh, it's an ever-changing display for the show. That was a lie. I would tell myself about that, too. Whereas now it's like I'm getting to the space where you can just put the figure up and stuff like that. I am ritualistic about opening because of okay. wee, wee bits. I've learned I have a spot and a knife and a table that, you know, so things don't bounce off and get eaten by the carpet monster or, <sighs> you know, the dogs or what have you, especially when you're dealing with, you know, things like Mezco or Mafex where they have a lot of little greeblies and bits. Yes. Um, I, I've learned keep a safe space to open things where you can make sure everything's there and it doesn't bounce and disappear. Okay. What about what about what, what what's your ritual when new things arrive, Mark? I know that sometimes you'll keep a backlog, but like what yeah. what is it usually a bit like? of a backlog? Okay. When I eventually get round to opening it, and you know, depending on what it is, if it's at the moment I'm collecting the Jada Street Fighter toys and Street Fighter 2 toys, I should say. And, you know, it's a it's a line that's still in progress. So, you know, I, I don't have a complete run of them. So there's a few of them that are kind of mostly just sitting in their boxes waiting until more arrive. So you actually have a significant collection of them to actually put out. I'm, I'm not, I don't really feel like just having a shelf with like, you know, four or five characters on it. Like it's a waste of space, in my opinion. I'll, I'll, I'll put something else there in the meantime, and when I eventually get the number of, of, of Street Fighters, maybe 12 or so, then I'll allocate uh, a specific space to them, you know, for for display. But when it comes to the actual opening, yeah, I am a little bit ritualistic with, with smaller figures, and especially, like Largo was saying, figures with small pieces. Um, I actually have, it's like a a pin box, essentially, that I upturn the lid, so I create, like, a, essentially a metal tray so anything small just kind of, as I take it out, pull off that bubble or whatever, it just kind of like drops on to the metal tree. I can see everything clearly. It's kind of reflective as well. So, you know, because, um, yeah, I've been I've been in that situation where you, you open up something, you chuck the packaging, it's in it's in the, you know, gone away in the, in the bins, in the trash. And a few days later, it's like, there was supposed to be two extra hands with this guy, and I don't really see them anywhere <laughs> here. Yeah. Yeah. I, now, my, uh, now my Peter Parker has to apparently look like he's boxing because he's no whip pans anymore, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. I Lately, and this is a big no-no uh, for me and my philosophy, but when something arrives and it has what I would call an excessive amount of extra parts, if the box itself is resealable, I tend to leave them in the box and then just put the box somewhere, uh, which I know, bad, bad gym, bad. It, uh, it, because there's certain figures that I'm like, I'll keep the box for that, you know, for, you know, for a certain reason. Like, example, uh, any of the elite wrestling figures, I tend to keep the boxes so far um, because they are resealable and they are nice. Um, that will probably change at some point. Um 
but like the the Super Seven, I know Super Seven, right? But the the Let Me Kill Mister uh, figure that I got, that's a beautiful box. It has a nice slip cover, has big fucking war pig thing on it, and he's you know cool. But then there's the stuff like I'll use Power Rangers as the example. Um, when they announced that the Lightning Collection remastered, it's like, oh, we're done. We're not doing any more. Like, what? And so I immediately scrambled. I like, that second went and found a Lightning Collection White Ranger because the Green Rangers were like triple the price. I was like, I'm not paying that. But for like $35, I managed to get a White Ranger you know, with Jason's face on it. I was like, that'll do. That'll do fine. He arrived. I got him out of the package. I got him posed and everything. And then his other bits remain in the box for now. Um, you know, and as I said before, I bought like 10 or 20 tackle box things to store parts in. Haven't used them yet. I haven't. Um, and eventually I'm going to be storing things through because there's some figures here that have extra hands. I, I just keep them on the stand with it as they move. And eventually I'm just going to have to put those away. So... When it comes to the extra bits and storing them over time, regardless of your system, do you tend to store them on a per figure basis or in larger lines like, and I'll use Motu or Marvel Legends as an example, do you just keep the extra parts by type of part and color? Like what's what's your system? Mark, you go first. Um, I'll show you my system. It's an awful system. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a mess. Okay. It's just so, an old r rusty coffee can. No, I have I have tons of these tackle boxes, but they're totally disorganized. Like in that one, <laughs> it might, there's there's mosquitoes head and there's uh, a spare. There's a few Motu Origins things scattered about here, but really, this is just a box. One of the many tackle boxes full of literal random random stuff. So there's Motu, there's WWE accessories, Transformers accessories. Everything, like everything is in this. NECA and um, guns, stuff like it's a total mess. And this is this is where I kinda effed up basically, where I was I could foresee that I needed to to like have something to store these pieces in, but because I tended just to pick up the storage as I needed it, as I was running, as one tackle box became full, I'd buy another one. I never bothered organizing everything, so it was just Okay, this one's full, buy another one, and now I've got like nine or ten of these, just all, everything's mixed up. Like, you can imagine, like, the type of stuff. Like, there's, um, like, random Spider-Man, Marvel Legends head just there in with all the Motu stuff, so you just don't know where you are. Yoda from the Black series, <laughs> like, it's just anything and everything, you know? Do, do you think it'll ever get to a point where you take a couple days and just try to reorganize them using what you yes. have? And... I do think it's going to get to that um, point because it annoys me every time I open yeah, one of these. Especially like, um, you know, we have the idea for a photo or something. You're like, Rice, I'm going to have this figure. He's going to have this accessory. I remember he came with that. Okay, where, the, where, did, I, where did I put that? Which box right. is that in? I, as many a time, man, I've opened up every one of those boxes, looking, looking through, sifting through. Is it here? Is it there? Oh, maddening. Still, yeah, could be worse. The excuse, the excuse that I tell myself for now is that I never plan to resell anything, so I can organize it or deorganize it however the hell I want. But the time is coming where I've got to start filling those boxes in, and I think the easy thing for me to do would be go buy toy line, and like with Origins, it'll be if it's hands. All the color hands that are of this type, so all the gripping hands that are flesh color here, regardless of, and then and then everything that's this color, and everything that's this color, and then the, the, and then it'll kind of go that way because other because the original idea, as you guys may recall, was each figure's yeah, it's gonna be a one little thing. No, because then I would have four or five times as many of these storage bins. So I know Largo. You are a little bit more and less systematic. Because I know that, for example, you do a lot of customization. So Action Force, for example, I know you just, you just have parts and yeah. so forth. Like how, what's because, your approach? Yeah, I, I do separate by uh, series or toy line. So like Marvel Legends, I have a separate bin for that stuff. And those are just kind of all together. 
Um, for Action Force, I have a series of tackle boxes because m almost all the parts are interchangeable, and I do a lot of kit bash. So, you know, I've got left hands, right hands in separate bins. I've got heads and weapons and all the different accessories. So that one's pretty well organized because I like to be able to just go and grab a piece and try things out for, for building my custom mercenary bits. Um, other toy lines are more problematic, like Mezco, like Moffex, SH Figure Arts, because they do come with a plethora of stuff, extra hands, extra feet sometimes, extra heads with different expressions. It, it's If you're not keeping the original boxes, which take up huge amounts of space, it's hard to keep all those things, keep them separated. So... I use a lot of Ziploc bags and just label, you know, this is this Mezco, this version of this guy, this is all his bits, you know, stuff like that. That helps. But then you have a, you know, big stack of Ziploc bags that need a home. That's, they're not easy to store without no, chaos. They're, they're not. Because I remember being so proud of myself having that bag system. And when it comes to putting it into a, a storage bin or a bucket, it's perfect, right? But when it comes time to then take it out of there and leave extra parts in, fucking forget it. Yeah. You know, so it, it becomes like, so the thing that I am compelled, I feel I have to do between now and moving into a house, you know, one is to get all the figures on the shelves as best as I possibly can so that when it comes time to pack, you just, this bins this. Yeah. This it's like great. The grandpappy's philosophy was, you know, the giant old uh, coffee cans. I, you know, you do, you can't you can't find those anymore. Those used to be like the ultimate storage. It, anywhere in in the the garage, there was at least two or three of those coffee cans full of nuts and bolts from, God knows where, washers and and whatnot. So his philosophy was very much: get what you can, can what you get, sit on the can. Eventually, you'll need it. Yeah, my dad was the same way. And when, and I think it's easy when we're talking about tools and machine parts. Yeah. It's a lot different than this, but yet it's not. The, I think we have both the advantage and burden of having things that have a specific purpose. So you have to be able to find them, right? And obviously, so far we've talked about, you know, what's it like setting up a display? What's it like to you know open toys what's it like to to clean the room what's it like to organize the pieces these are all things that you know generally speaking that they, they, they bring a certain degree of anxiety they bring they invite chaos sometimes um and if we're not feeling at our best there's gonna be plenty of days where you just don't feel like doing it for whatever reason um so my next question is, is a hefty one. What about your collection room is the eye of the storm? What about your collection room is something that no matter what you're feeling, there's some small thing you can at least get a half smile out of when things are at their worst. And I'm going to start with Largo on this one. Hmm. I've been through some uh, stuff this year. It's it's just about broke me. Um, personal stuff, finance stuff, medical stuff with my wife. Uh, it, best laid plans of mice and men all got kind of waylaid. I had plans for doing things for the channel, for the collection, for what have you. That all kind of got thrown out the window, and I'm kind of in free fall. But right in my eye line is always... One of my favorites. I've got the doctor, Matt Smith's version. Uh, there's just something about this one that I, I like. And it's it's always that, you know, when chaos rides, the doc is always there to say, well, you know, we'll figure it out. Put on your bow tie and go. There you go. Okay. So for you, it's just that one figure you can just look at and just kind of center. Yeah. Okay. Not the answer I was expecting, but a good one. Mark, what about you? G1 Prime, always my G1 Prime, and not like my nice G1 Prime that sits in in that when it's boxed and all that stuff. I'm talking about like my 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 beater, my like it's like 
the chrome's worn off. I've had him like forever, <laughs> pretty much, but he's just he's janky and stuff. But it's just a nice thing to pick up, transform him, transform him back. I don't need to look at it. It's like almost like this weird. It's like a strat ball, even though it's a die cast hard edge piece of metal. That's you know, but you get what I'm saying. You know, it's something I play with it. It gives my hands something to do if I'm feeling a little bit anxious, a little bit off. It's familiar to me. There's a, a feeling of comfort to us. Like, you know, I know the toy inside out. It's just a, it's just a weird thing. But I do have to say, in general, um, like, I retreat to this room, essentially. Like, I, I kind of run here to escape. Um, kind of being in the room in itself tends to... If it doesn't put me completely at ease, it at least begins the process of me coming to some type of semblance of calm or contentment um, over a period of time, you know. So try and keep it very chill. I used to have a TV in here, don't have a TV anymore. If I need to do something like this, I have a little folding table so I can bring in the laptop. Most of the time I try to keep it just it's me, it's silent and whatever a little bit of rubbish in the corner that we won't talk about but you know it's um yeah it's mostly an air of calm about this room for me and i think for anyone who pursues having that space to display your the things you love most i think that's the goal you know uh obviously i want to go there and, and ha you know lack of space is what it is so i i had mm. to combine my office and my collection room um it is not a mistake I will ever make again if I can help it. Um, when it comes time to do like day to day work or, or any kind of task that I, generally speaking, don't want to have to be doing, it's in here. And so when I got laid off from my job last year, I stayed out of this room with the exception of live streams all the time. In fact, I made it a point not to go into this room for a long time. And it's taken me almost the entire year this year to come back around to like, okay, that that's, oh, that part of your life's over. Reframe the room into what you want, do things the way you want to do them. So that when the time comes that I am doing consistent work or unpleasant tasks in this place that I'm going to be happy. Right. But what I've also found, especially since I started getting the shelves correct, but even before that big push, I could just turn my chair around and look at the room and I'm going to change the camera angle just so people kind of get a better idea of what I, I, I look at, you know, just to turn around and be able to look at not just what's there, but now it's look what you've already done with the room. Look what you have already accomplished. Everything else is one package at a time, one figure at a time, enjoy it. And, what I was saying before is that every time I come into the room now, I will move something. You know, if I don't open, I'll move something somewhere. Like, for example, I'm looking at my Wind Raider right now, and the one wing is up and the other one isn't. So I'm, before I leave the room, I'm going to switch that wing and probably put a figure in there because it's flying on its own. It looks really weird. Um, shit like that. You know, for a while, it was just the superpowers display because that was the one that was the most important. Everyone knows that's the big collection for me. Uh, even though I put so much emphasis on Motu, it's just like, well, superpowers is like my favorite thing. You should do a special on just the Wind Raider, you know, breaking it down, customizing it. I'd call it breaking wind. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I did do a video of the Wind Raider and having to put it back in the box. I had to build it up. <laughs> I remember. Down. It doesn't want yeah. to go back in. <laughs> no, it really didn't want to go back in the box. So when I unboxed it the other day, again... Um, it was actually really easy to do because I remember like, oh, you, this, this, this. And I retained all the parts and everything and it's great. And it went together like gangbusters. I fucking love it. Um, and to, to, to be in a space, like it was a weird thing. With figures, it's one thing to open it up, put the accessories, whatever. But with a vehicle that has parts that you know you cannot take back apart to know that I have nothing to fear from this. I finally get to put this together to go click, 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 and just have the stand and go, you're not going back in that box, are you, son? You know, that was just like, oh, it felt so good. 
until I looked at the empty box. I said, where the fuck am I going to put you now? Because <laughs> unfortunately, the, you know, the most brilliant thing about Motu boxes in Origins boxes as well is that they're beautiful. And they great artwork. Necessary, and they, they don't really retain that beauty when you flatten them. I tried it once. And I thought, well, what if I flatten it and just cut off the bits I don't want and make it like this rectangular thing I can, you know, and then permanently seal it this way so I can look at the front, I can look at the back. It, it works for some boxes, but not all. So I've just decided, okay, now I'm just going to be that guy and I'm going to keep empty boxes. I'm going to make them look as nice as they can empty. And then there's going to be a box wall somewhere in the house. We, I lovingly refer to it as the fire hazard dream. <laughs> you know, um, it's something I want to do, but the vehicle like that or, or place it or whatever it's like, like that's not going to fit back in the box after I do this. Um, I think it's a glorious feeling, um, you know, and then it's just like, well, and so it says, well, what are you going to do when you have to move it? I'm like, nothing a lot of bubble wrap can't solve. You know, you just wrap the sucker in bubble As wrap. As a YouTuber, one advantage you do have is when you do an unboxing video, that's sort of like your, your archive. It's like if you don't want to keep a box, but, you know, a lot of the box art and stuff, the presentation is really cool. So you video it, and then you have the video. You can always go back and look at it. You don't have to keep the physical box that takes up space. Right, and for, I would say, 90% of of boxes out there, I I could get less of a shit. And I also <laughs> find that it's it's... Uh, an advantage that loose vintage collectors have over someone who collects some modern stuff or box collectors as well. Where it's like, it doesn't have to matter. Um, but with Motu boxes, it's like, this stuff's great. So like, I, I, you know, as you guys know, I, I keep all my card backs, all of them. Now, the caveat there is like when I buy eight Horde Troopers, I keep one card. I'm not yeah. going to keep all eight of them. There's no reason to do that. I want an example of every card back, and I have binders that I've bought and page protectors that I've bought to slide them in. Have I put one card back in one slot? No, I have not. I have a stack of cards there. I have a stack of cards there. I have stacks of cards in there, and the binders, I don't know where the fuck they're at. You know, they're, they're here somewhere. It's gonna you, happen. You and eventually. you and Laser Pants need to get together and have a scrapbooking session and just <laughs> make that happen. Because he's does he he's, do the same thing. He does with some of the Action Force stuff. He he you know takes the card backs or some of the you know uh, sure. character profiles and stuff. Some and, and it, it works. It's a good idea. <sighs> For me, it's more. Um, I love the art of stuff. I'm looking on my shelf and I don't see anything handy, but like. Uh, I love these things, like the old annuals. I know you probably have some of these, Mark. Um, they used to, every year, they'd have these hardcover annuals that came out, uh, whether it was superheroes or Battle Action Force or something. And they're just like a time capsule. You've got stories, and some of them have, you know, ads, like here's the Robo Skull. So you've got some of the vintage art or some of the vintage uh, promotional pictures and stuff. And it's a lot easier to keep some of these on the shelf and be able to reference them than, sure. you know, trying to keep all the card yeah, backs and boxes thing, like, and stuff. They did like the Motu <sighs> Digest of all the mini comics as one of my oh, yeah. books because if I ever want to reference something, for example, I can go over there and pick the, the book up and do it. And that used to be the case. Now it's in there somewhere. I got to get it out because yesterday and people were like losing their shit over that. Uh, Mattel Creations reveal. I like. I saw the figure. I'm like, I recognize that guy. And then I looked it up, and I saw the cover of, of the comic, and I'm like, oh, I had this comic. This is a good story. It's cool they're making this character. There's a company called Teshin, a book publisher, and they do these little tchotchke books of vintage comic, vintage sci-fi, pulp novel. Mm -hmm. Um, they're very inexpensive. I picked them up on Amazon. I've got one for uh, Fantastic Four, Adventures, uh, a couple of others. And it's that same kind of thing, like with the little Superpowers mini digests. It's, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's great Kirby art, you know, and stuff from throughout the years. And it'll, you know, it'll have like, here's a particular, you know, cover that was interesting and have a little bit about the artist or whatever. I love this kind of stuff because it's it's like reference of 
everybody involved, the artists, um, you know, even there's some pictures of a convention, comic book convention from back in the day. This is from 1969 at the Statler Hilton. You know, it's just like oh, oddball stuff you wouldn't normally think of or, or you know, been around for. But these kind of things, they're either I'll have them on the shelf for reference or I'll put them into a display. Like if I'm doing a vintage Avengers display, I'll have this in the background and then have the figures in front. And that, that's kind of how I build stuff. So I'm always picking up oddball pieces that are non-toy as either backgrounds or reference. Does that make sense? It does, and I think it really fits well with your overall uh, display aesthetic where you have, generally speaking, open shelves, mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're not in a grid or anything like that. Um, and it, I, I think it lends itself. Like, like Every time I look at this blank space behind all of this, I go, ugh, because there's part of me that wants to print out something or have something printed, uh, to go up there. And then, of course, I, I look at like Billy Wifta, who's got this great flag that's like an attorney in background that you can get on Amazon. You get it in like a billion different sizes. And it was like, well, maybe I should just get that, pin it up, and then be happy. And I might do that, but everything's out of reach. Just... I'm, I'm going to grab a piece because, uh, yeah, okay. I'll be right back. Right on. Um, with your enclosed display space, Mark. I, I know a lot of people with details and shit like that, like they'll go out of their way to like have that. You have, it seems like a more uniform, like it is what it is and you let the display dictate that. Um, have you ever thought about going in a different direction with that or, or, or do you like prefer things to look more of that museum curation kind of vibe? For my toys specifically, I am quite happy i would say more than happy with with the current setup i have no desire to to change the format so to speak the, the only thing that um changes for me I'm, I'm a little bit like Stu, universal toy collector where i will have things set up a certain way for a while and then one day just like i'm just going to totally take all these shelves and just mix everything around and you know, caused myself a lot of grief for no reason other than the fact that I wanted to see what the turtles would look like on the middle shelf instead of on the top shelf. And then sometimes I might even put all the stuff back the way it was before. But I just, you know, I, I've often like said, you know, I'm I'm at a point where I'm like 99.9% .9 happy and then it's like, well, I'm just going to change this one thing. And then changing right. that one thing always causes like a domino effect of you just fiddling around with everything else. But yeah, yeah. it's a... Uh, it's a strange, a strange thing indeed. Yeah, just moving the figures around sometimes will create a whole different vibe. Oh, um, sure. But these, these are something uh, I highly recommend. They're little tin signs. You can find them on Amazon. They're cheap, five to ten bucks. Here's one for Star Trek classic. Um, so when I've got my playmates, you know, vintage TOS guys, I'll have this in the background. And, you know, if it gets banged up or scratched, it just adds to the vintage vibe. So these are great because they're shelf size. They're small. They're easy to put in a background. Um, and, you know, similar to like a comic book. You know, I use I use a lot of comics. If I have a cover that I really like, I'll use that as a background. I keep some packaging for that purpose. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I, this one, I think, came from a Buzz Lightyear. And I just like the background, so I'll cut off the bits and I'll put that in the background somewhere just to have a spot of color other than just blank wall. Yeah, like um, Studio Series uh, Transformers, all of them come with something for the most part. Yeah, and, and as long as they don't have they don't, something glued to it that it's going to rip up the and artwork. And they don't link together in any specific way, and I don't know that I'll ever use them to their full advantage, but I can't bring myself to throw them away. I couldn't even bring myself to put them in storage. They're all up there. That is the danger is, together. you know, it's, I will use this and then it just sits in a stack. I've got a stack of cardboard that's just, you know, another thing is if you have somebody who has a good printer or you can find somebody who can do some, uh, you know, printing on large scale for you. This is just a, a really big photograph that was put together, you know, digitally and then print it out. And then I have it on a piece of uh, cardstock. And 
it's a great background, you know, so I use this with toy photography or it sits on the back of a shelf. I need to re-glue it. It's starting to come up. But, and that's you know, something that I actually was going to bring up is that when the time comes to have, you know, the house that has the collection rooms and all this different stuff, because each collection to a certain degree will have its own space. So music will be kept probably in the music room uh, where I play drums and stuff like I'll have vinyls on the wall and CDs will be the way they are now and stuff like that. But then also uh, video games will have a separate display. Like every all the movies and video games are together now in the living room, and that's just the way it has to be. Each place will have its thing, right? And then there'll be posters and knickknacks and everything else, whatever. But when it comes to like these backgrounds we're talking about or wanting to have like that poster you could never have as a kid or whatever, one of the things I want to invest in is a large format printer and a large format laminator. And just have those. So if I want a poster, I just find the high res picture, print the sucker out, laminate it. On the wall it goes. And because it's laminated, I can store it and it's gonna be totally fine. You know, and, and it rotate things out that way, for example. You know, put like universal mounting hardware on everything so that everything can just you can rotate the stuff out and make a quick display thing if you want to. But like with the toy display my hope against hope and it's going to take time for me to build it in the way that i want to do it and i'm going to try to relish that process to make sure it's exactly what i want i want to have dioramas that are whenever possible 360 degrees and where that's not possible they're expansive so you can kind of do whatever you want to do they'll have their own background so each toy line will have its own space and it, it'll take up a lot of space, which is why we're looking at such large rooms and places to, to put these things. I am tinkering with an idea that might help with that. Uh, hmm. The local dollar store, whatever version, family dollar, dollar tree, whatever it is you have handy. If you go to the kitchen section, they will have lazy Susans that you can pick up for, yes. you know, a dollar. I, I've got a couple of different ones and the, the running idea is to repaint or redo it somehow so that it can be a, a piece where you can do like you could have a 360 diorama on a Lazy Susan on the shelf and then you just turn it when you want to see the other details. So that is a work in project I'm tinkering with. With, with. with that in mind, they don't make Lazy Susans in the sizes that I'll need for like full play sets, for example. True. So one of one of the things I've toyed with because woodworking is something I want to look into as well. So let's say I have a table, and that's going to have all the attorney and stuff on it. Now that particular table will be in the center of the room, and you'll be able to walk around. Like there's no that's such a huge collection. That's the best way to do it. But if I wasn't going to have that in the center, and I want it against the wall. This is the idea I came up with was well. You can build Lazy Susans. You just have to have ball bearings and you have to get measurements and stuff like that. It takes but balls. Now, it does, literally and figuratively. The idea would be, okay, so with Castle Grayskull, I need one that's probably around this big, but round. But it doesn't have to be round. You can make it whatever shape you need it to be. So using a jigsaw, custom cut it to the shape that you want it to be. Then you get, um, with that, that large format printer, you, you, you print out the floor of Castle Grayskull in color and on contact paper. You put it on there, you wrap it around the whole thing, hmm. and then you then install it onto a Lazy Susan at its center point. And then now you've got something where you can rotate the whole playset however you want to constantly see it. Now, that's a very intricate custom thing to do. And I think for some things it'll work, for other things it won't. You know, flight stands or a thing. Like, there's tons of stuff you could get into when it comes to that type of custom display stuff. Um, but I think when you get to a, a literal and figurative mental place uh, where you have that as an option, that that's how you upgrade your display, I would say that's when you would find a certain degree of zen and the hobby returns. Right. So, you know, Mark's in a place where he's happy with what he's got. And he, you know, you, you add a few figures here and there, you move things around. 
with my and whereas you have also a dedicated space where it's in a constant state of evolution to a certain degree i would say largo and knowing you as a tinkerer i feel like you may never quite get to the place where mark is but that's also in some form by design would you agree with that i would i think that's fair I think i'm it's always for me too yeah it, so I have, you know, very thematic shelves based on dirt certain properties, Batman 66, Superpowers, Conan, everybody's got their space. And yeah, I'll, I'll just kind of go in and tinker and as new pieces come in or a, a new diorama bit or what have you, yeah, I'll take it all apart, redo it again and, and just rearrange. So some of it, it's, it's kind of like it, when you mentioned Zen, I, I'm think like bonsai tree guys that just do the little, you know, subtle right. manipulation and bits. So with you, you're looking at dioramas mainly. That's kind yeah. of where your head's at. So it's more static. And although I am also looking at that, I very much want to be at a place where each toy line has a display. It's action oriented, but it also encourages play. So yeah. none of my display solutions should be something where this has to go here or, or it won't work. Everything has to be modular and move around and whatnot. So, yeah, I'll probably keep Grayskull in the same place and Eternia and Snake Mountain, Hall of Justice, what have you. But within that space, I should have the flexibility to play with the toys and have fun, whether for photography, changing the uh layout just so it makes more sense for me and has fun um machinima whatever i want like like, like to me it's weird mashugana oh. no wait that's something different <laughs> yes but to be 40 years on from all of these toy lines you know and then to just want to come all the way back around to all this money and all this work and to just i just want to play with them yeah you know, I tried to make double duty with some of my displays for toy photography. Like, oh, I can use that background when I'm doing, you know, certain right. images or whatever. It's, it never works because once you have it set up on a display, trying to take it apart just to get a piece to do a photo shoot and then put it back. It, it, yeah, it just, it's just a mess. So I have a separate stack of stuff for toy photography that's, you know, not for the display. So the tax of having a constantly evolving space i find is that it's it feels impossible to get to that space where instead of it being special for me to turn around and look at my display and, and enjoy it it should be the constant and then everything else kind of falls in line along with that and i think some of that comes from the chase to a certain degree, although the frantic manic chase of toys has very much died down for me for many reasons. The biggest one of which is that the things that I thought I would never have, I now have in many cases. So now I get to kind of move the goalpost, but I've moved the goalpost and changed my pace at the same time. So it's like winning a marathon then going, okay, well now I want to get another 10 K or whatever, but I'm going to walk. And I'm going to see the sights along the way. That's kind of where I'm at with it. Yeah. And I think that a lot of collectors are are at a point or seem to be in a constant state where they're chasing after something, whether it's the next toy, completing a line, uh, getting the best deal for its own sake, a certain display aesthetic. Something tends to elude them. And most of the collectors I meet and talk to are chasing something rather than stopping and enjoying what they have while they have it while they can um and i, I know mark you've got a lot to say on this um as someone who is more or less in that spot do you have advice and if so what is it to getting to a point where you can enjoy it and still have that hobby of the chase how do you prioritize that how do you how do you approach it because obviously that's I, that should be the goal for everyone i think where, where do you stand with this well earlier on i mentioned about 
you know, acquiring some of those Jada Street Fighter figures and how I actually haven't, yes. um, you know, set them up yet, okay? Now, I, I know I mentioned that the reason I haven't set them up on display yet is because I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for more of them to come in and there's a bit more, then there'll be a significant display. But another reason, because I've been through this a few times over the years, is sometimes when you're... Um, collecting something and you're like actively collecting a particular line the the gaps or the holes or the missing characters you can become fixated on it you kind of start to almost look past what you have already and only are looking at the holes you're looking at the characters that aren't there ironically you know and um for me i think sometimes it's about just kind of maybe grinding yourself a bit and saying okay look um if, is this Kind of, if, if what I'm looking at isn't like making me, uh, you know, happy or satisfied, maybe it's it's not worth looking at at all, or maybe I should just put it away for a while and put something else there that I am happy to look at and that I'm not kind of hemming and hawing over. And you know, I'll just fill it with my like you know complete collection of naked turtles. And you know, when more Street Fighter figures come in, I might be happy enough then to actually set them out and display. And I'll I'll feel at that point that I have enough of them that I'm not really feeling that hunger that I need to like fill those gaps or get those important characters or that specific character that I'm missing and but it can be tough and like things will niggle at you like you know and you know like I try to practice what I preach but I still will falter you know um most recent example is probably the um those studio series Dinobots it felt like I was waiting an eternity to get Swoop, who was like the final, the final member of the team, and it was starting to bug me. Like when I'd look over at the shelf, because instead of being happy with the four other Dinobots, I was just annoyed at the fact that Swoop wasn't with them, and it was well, yeah, it like, was bothering it, for me for that, a while, you know. For, for for those that don't collect that that line, Grimlock, the leader, came out either the year before or the year that I started collecting. I started collecting twenty one, and then you got each successive Dinobot six to eight months after that or longer and so oh. just came out three, four yeah. months ago, started shipping. So it's like a three, four year process to get what five guys, six tops if you yeah. count, you know, certain variants. Moffex uh, is a lot like that. Like I've been collecting their hush collecting hush collection and that's been like two years and they're still going so just to get a core collection like like mark was saying it's like to make a shelf it takes a couple of years just for them to put them out you know right it's frustrating so so i you know and then you kind of have to go you know so when you're building a display let's say you know my philosophy going into the the permanent toy space i will eventually have and to a lesser degree in this space as well, it's like, well, here's how much space I have for this toy line. And maybe I don't have everything I want, but here's what I have. And I'm going to make the best display on this shelf for them that I can. And the reason that I'm pursuing it that way is because I, I don't want to put myself in a position where I just compress stuff to fit more things on the shelf. And then more things come and I have to totally rethink everything. So I have to like make a larger space look cozier and make sense in some cases. Um, but that's just, you know, a pie in the sky. Like here, here, here's where I'm going with this. But then there's, you still have that thing that nags you and so forth when it comes to incomplete things. Uh, but then of course you have toy lines, whether vintage or modern where, one has a sizable amount of stuff that will make a wonderful display. But like you said, some people just, they can't see the forest for the trees. And the, the, those trees in, in this case are missing. Mm -hmm. right? So I, 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 I think that some people just, especially completionists, I find, will say, well, I'm not going to tackle this as a proper display until... I get the thing and that that's a shame, you know, but then you have guys, um, and I, I do not want to call anyone out, but the, the, the best example of this, like I think of is my buddy pixel Dan, who his classics collection 
of Motu is just them in rows. There's like five rows on a pedestal, and there they are. And it looks great. And I understand that you only have so much space. You have to, if you want to display everything, you've got to make certain choices, certain versions of toy lines, stuff like this, you know, because I have like three different scales of fucking turtles and stuff like that. Like it happens, right? So I understand why he did that. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with it. I know he's happy. He's got other more dynamic displays for other parts of the line. And he's got a very eclectic display aesthetic, depending upon the room he's in. But then you have people who will do the same thing that he's done, and they'll leave a space for the thing that's not there. That is like, that's like shooting yourself in the arm and then every so often pouring salt in it to remind you <laughs> that it's there. Yeah, I made the mistake of getting into uh, original G.I. Joe um, well, Adventure Team G.I. Joe, my original, you know, Kung Fu Grip, Fuzzy Head, way late in the game. I wasn't collecting. Uh, I had some in my original collection that I sold off before I became an expat. Yeah, you just uh, decided, about, what, two years ago? Yeah, just, yeah. just, you know, it's, it's, it's like you guys have run into this where you pick up that one figure and it's like, I just want the one. And then suddenly yeah. you have 10. Uh, and, oh man, what a rabbit hole. And yeah, I, I am missing the vintage air adventurer. I have the other guys and it's very frustrating because like Mark was saying, I enjoy the ones I have, but I'm always looking at the spot where I should have the other guy. It's like, I don't even, you know, he's not even my favorite Joe, but I got to have him to complete the set, you know? And, you know. Then you have like the incomplete holes where like it's like Psycho Man in Fantastic Four. I don't have any particular uh, affinity for that character. I appreciate where he's at. I like the character. But if you just said way back, way back in August of 21, when I pre-ordered the Fantastic Four line, which was my first new pre-order, I was so excited. I made a video about it. I'm embarrassed by it, to be f quite frank. <laughs> um I, I did not think I would get, ever get Psycho Man. Never thought I would. Mm. Then Big Bad one day says, oh, he's six bucks now. And I said, well, I've got everything else. I'll get him for six bucks. Because there's other stuff on the sale. It's like, ah. And then I got him. He's a beautiful figure. And he fits just fine. But I would never have gone to that length had the deal not been there. Right. Um, it's like the high evolutionary. I remember reading one Marvel comic where he was in it. It's not a character yeah. I really care about, but they put it out for that fantastic. But what's funny series. is that uh, that I, I got the comic version of High Evolutionary in the same circumstance, probably in the same order um, that I got him in. And I was like, well, now it's complete. But then in spoilers, uh, freaking Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, he's the main baddie. So it's like I have a different because I, I knew about him growing up. I'd read about him. He was in the Marvel handbook that I one of the Marvel handbooks I had. So I knew everything about him. I thought it was a really cool character. Just didn't have a direct link to him. Now I can say, well, I, I like the comic to a certain degree, but I saw that character. I like that movie, blah, 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 blah. But he arrives and then it's like, OK, cool. So now I know what I'm going to do with my display and i've got like three doctor dooms now so it's like well, one doctor doom goes with fantastic four one goes with Sp this 15th spider-man that i have one goes over here you know um and i feel like that or like uh example like gifts will arrive the ghostbusters uh headquarters being a good example where it's like oh i didn't plan on getting this now i have it do I change everything up or is there a slot for it kind of a thing? So when good fortune arises and you're suddenly inundated with something or some things that you didn't think were going to happen. And I know Mark has a story about this. Um, like what, how do you react to that? You know, in those moments. So I'll, I'll let you think on that Largo. Mark, you go ahead. Cause I think I know exactly what story you're going to tell, but surprise me. I, I'm, it's you know, the story I tell all the time, and it's our, our good friend Carl Gojitron. Look, I'll show you. Look, we've got um, got Snake Mountain and all this glory there. We've got 
Castle Grey Skull and all its glory there. I would not have any of this set up at the moment if it wasn't for Gojitron a few years ago sending me the Origins He Man and Skeletor and Battle Cat. No intention of collecting Motu. You know, I had one or two vintage pieces. They were they were fine. I like watching the cartoon, but I never collected the toys. As soon as I had those toys in my hands, completely fell in love with them. And here I am now with a whole like couple of glass cabinets half full of them. You know, it's just it's crazy. So you want to talk about changing setups. I mean, like, yeah, I had to um had to relocate. There was a lot of unhappy toy lines that were like demoted <laughs> to the boxes and sent back into the attic or sent to the doldrums of the loft, you know. Who knows what will happen to them, you know, but they're not living in the high-rise uh, glass cabinets anymore. Now the Motu men live there, and that's life, you know. But, yeah, it, like, it's... I'm just kind of trying to, trying to kind of weigh it up, if I had to say. I'd say nearly one-sixth of what's on display here now is Origins. Like, that's crazy. From, from going from having no intention of getting any to getting a good chunk of the line like i've only recently kind of winded down picking them up just because you know the usual reasons money and space but yeah totally spun me off in a direction i had never even thought about going you know always something i could admire from afar but i'm never going to own any i'm never going to buy any i collect enough stuff who needs to start collecting another line well i did apparently yeah, and, and you have the challenge, too, of being across the pond, where if you're collecting Doctor Who, Blake Seven, Thunderbirds, you're in the right spot. But if you want to collect any American-centric brands, it can be a challenge for you to pick up. It can be. And, you know, with Origins, we got lucky over here just during that wacky time with the panda endemic, uh, you mm. know, to us. Uh, Pandemonium. You know, just, uh, yeah, the pandemonium, everything just went to, you know, the hell in a handbasket. But for whatever reason over here, all of a sudden we started getting your toys, sometimes even before you guys were, were getting them. Um, and it was yeah, just to the, to the point the way where it worked what out. happened is you guys would get the American releases and we'd get the international ones sometimes. Uh, that happened a lot with Big Bad, where they would get the international release card back first and say, well, we've got it. Do you still want this card back or do you want the American variant i'm like i don't care just give it to me you know just come on um so when fortune does strike largo like what give do you have an example of that and how did you react to it at the time yeah carl's a great example gojitron is very generous and he's smart he'll feature a piece on his channel and then to make room he'll gift it so it's like now it's your problem so right uh i i had picked up some stuff on one of his random sales and he threw in a couple of extra bits and that actually kind of started me down the rabbit hole of one six scale adjacent stuff so i've got a couple of like giant robot guys i've got a predator that's in the one six scale so they work with the adventure team joes so it's like mm -hmm. You know, so I've got my core group of Joes, and then I have, like, the monsters and, and knockoff guys. And, you know, so there's, like, this other, you know, sidebar collection that I wasn't expecting that one six scale takes up a lot of space. That, that yeah. is definitely a problem. Yeah, I, but, I have one one six scale figure, and that's a, a, a repro Adventure Team Joe, but dressed as... A GI Joe grunt from the cartoon with 3D printed parts and all that. Oh, nice! That uh, that that Nerd Rage got for me eons ago. It feels, and it's like, okay, that's the perfect one to get because it liter literally is GI Joe. Yeah. So, okay, I can put this in, a, you know, and in my mind's eye, like I'll have a separate work office, and that will have like the super nice, you know, like mahogany wood or whatever with the glass case vibe and all the really fine nice stuff goes in Corinthian there. leather perhaps yes I'm very important I'm a big deal um, but like for example the the Mezco 112 Spidey you sent along with the the, the Green Goblin display will be in there um, the Moffex stuff that you sent me will go in there um, certainly that one sixth Joe 
you know, the nicer, poignant stuff, like the Mego, Spidey, and Captain America. The, the, the Speaking of that. Really heartfelt stuff will go in there. Spider-Man King Size, uh, yeah. number, number nine from 1973. I think I paid five bucks for it. It's not an expensive comic. This makes a great background for that Mezco Spidey with the Green Goblin. Mm -hmm. It's just classic. So, yeah, I'll find cheap cover art that I love that goes in the background with those characters, especially with superheroes. Yeah, and I find that the collection, the idea of spreading certain things. So, like, Lauren's burgeoning Barbie collection. She's going to have her own Lady Lair room where she can put those there and she can display them. She has a bunch of cool ideas which ones stick. We'll see. Uh, but she also has other stuff like plushies and stuff she'll want to have in there, and it'll be that'll be her own thing. So you're I'll saying have. she has her lady bits on display? No, not so much. No. Not so much. Um, but ha ha. So I have the work office with the with the extra nice stuff. Then you'll have the toy room that has like the more traditional toy collection. Music will have its place. Film will have its place. But there's going to be certain pieces I find that are going to find their way throughout the house. Because they are that they lend themselves to that. The reason I bring this up, especially for Mark, I'm curious about this. I know you do this as well, Largo. But like, how much of your collection like bleeds over into the house proper, if anything? And if so, like, how do you make that decision or decide not to do that? Like, what for 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 you? How does that work? So at the moment, for me very very little bleeds out of this room and i have to say that it's mainly by choice um we have a beautiful house to be honest with you. my wife um she's quite the eye for decor and she really did um you know do a lot of the interior design here and it's and the house is just mostly perfect the way it is however things have bled out and have ventured out of the room so a lot of my um Hapo dinosaurs you'll often see around the house because they're so nicely sculpted and painted. They do look like actual proper statues, you know, and they're they're, they're very nice just to look at. So they, you'll see them randomly scattered on kind of, you know, fireplaces, around fireplaces, shelves, coffee tables, things like that. But there's nothing really, uh, I would say, that would be intrusive where you'd walk into the house and like you just know that I lived here. Like it's not really until you get into this room that you kind of see this is where it's at. Like there is a lot of stuff scattered around the house in terms of storage, but that's not on display. Like that's, you know, right. it's in boxes, it's in bins, it's under beds, it's in attics, it's in, you know, cupboards. But in terms of having stuff spread out of the room, Unless it's only a, a temporary arrangement, I might be setting up a photo or something like that. So you might have some stuff, you know, sitting in the kitchen while you're getting things together. But other than that, it's largely confined to this room, apart from some random dinosaurs scattered throughout the house. But even that, it's like there's a, a kind of a standard baseline of aesthetic that would, would actually fit anywhere else in the house for you. That's kind of like the bar. Is that correct? So similar That's to what right. I'm saying with like an office display would be the nicer stuff that 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 needs to be kept locked away that you don't want anyone to touch, you know. And I know that you do something similar, Largo. Uh, I think in your I, living room is that right? I, I have a TV room slash lounge area upstairs, and the way I justify it is television and film centric. So okay. all of my MCU figures are in a glass case up there. Uh, my Star Trek film guys, my Wrath of Khan Enterprise, that kind of stuff. Um, if, if it has to do with something that I've seen on the telly or the big screen, those go in that display. With the exception of Doctor Who, just because I like to keep him handy. At least favorite doctors. Like I've got, you know, number four behind me. I've got uh, number 11 over here. You know, it, there, but for the most part, film and television are kind of out of the space just because I'm out of space. Yeah. And things that, again, so much about collecting is like, if you if you had told me this when I started, I wouldn't believe you. Um, for example, getting that Lemmy figure, you know, I would have thought that that would eventually find its place in the music room for obvious reasons. But and maybe it still will. But for right now, he's proudly on top of our television alongside the Iron Sheik because Lauren and I bonded over documentaries about both of those guys 
and she has an affinity for them as much as I do. So they, they're in the living room. And um, it, it's a, again, it's a cool feeling to have that kind of support. And I get to see them every single day. You know, anytime we're watching the film, at least once I'll look up and see him and just be like, mm. you know, it's really cool for me. Uh, there is something to be said for the juxtaposition of putting a display together with characters that would never be together, like Iron Sheik. And, you know, it's like, and let me, you know, I, I'd love to see. They do yeah. have a, a, a minor linkage in their involvement with WWE because Motorhead Fair. did do a song for Triple H years later. Da, 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 da. So if someone calls me out, I'll be like, ah, ah, ah. You know, even though that's not why they're together at all. <laughs> but but it, there I, I want to see I want to see the uh, the the themed grumpy shelf of Grumpy Bear, Skeletor, you know, several villains. Where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> she's in a mood. Yeah. Yeah, she just wants it, a hug. It's it's a thunderstorm, and she does not like the oh, so yeah, she's. Fair. It's well, okay. You know, when it comes to like a themed grumpy bear display, like I have the full size plushie. I have a mini plushie about this tall. I've got that guy. Uh, uh, I like, like that one. I know which one you're talking about. There. Yeah. Um, so I could do that. But as far as like, uh, you know, grumpy figures, you know, like of course there could be. I, have I, I want to see a display forward. where you have Skeletor and all the major villains like totally defeated with grumpy bear on a throne of bones standing over them <laughs> that's possible it's a thing it's a thing um, however i think it'd be <laughs> more fun and this is something i would i would i would go out of my way i would 3d print like a big poker table like oh, a yeah. big one and then have villains sitting around and in the center instead of cash are the heads of all the heroes <laughs> you know um and I, and people were like, "Well, who is Grumpy Bears? Who would who would his be?" I'm like, I'll find a strawberry shortcake, put that there in the go. center, you know, a rainbow uh, bright. <laughs> ooh, nice one. Or like a oh, what about a wuzzle? Like the Grumpy Bear ripoff, like a wuzzle. I barely something. remember the wuzzles. Yeah, yeah. So does so do they, you know. But um, you know, and I think this conversation is as direct reflection of not just the subject matter itself, but like kind of goals. Like we're the longer the conversation goes on, the more whimsical we get, the more fun <laughs> we're having yeah. with it. And I, I think that really, I, I hope if you're listening to this at home uh, or wherever you may be, I, I hope that this is, this conversation is continuing to be a reminder that this is supposed to be fun folks. Like, how am I supposed to keep my collection in the van down by the river? <laughs> right. And I have found myself all too often uh, lamenting good fortune for the challenges that it brings rather than just enjoying it in the moment. Um, you know, the reason attorney has stayed in my living room for three weeks is because, one, it was nice to remind myself that it indeed exists and that I own it. But also, I was dreading the moment when I would have to drag it in here. And now what do I do with it, right? Mm. Uh, but now it, it's in here. I found a, a way to figure things out and everything's fine. It, and it will get to this place. Like we were saying, but we were talking before about how good fortune can influence something. Well, the original concept for a big display room was going to be shelves like this all the way around the place and then the center similar shelves but it would be you know that 360 style display where you could have the dioramas on both sides and this and that it'd be fun well then when there's an attorney a place at coming you go well that's not going to work you can't you can't contain eternia in that way they don't really make a shelf <laughs> that's going to accommodate that in that way no and if they do, it'd be so expensive. It's like, fuck off. There's no way. So then it became, well, this is just going to have a table. And maybe I'll build some things around it that can have shelving and stuff. So you have perches and stuff. So it just changed my whole concept of everything. Uh, and it, it's, and you know, some, some people collect in isolation. Some people collect in a community or group. 
I definitely find, you know, we have circles within circles. We all kind of know each other from the toy collecting community. Certain people are Motu, certain people are military or what have you, but everybody has somewhere where they intersect. For me, I found uh, really connecting with Wilhelm from Wilhelm Toy and Hobby. We just click and we bounce ideas off each other. So when you're looking at a blank space or you want to make a blank space for something new, you know, I'll bounce ideas off of him and we'll talk about stuff. And that helps. So find a buddy who has a similar interest and, uh, you know, yeah. bounce some display ideas off of them. Absolutely. Well, Mark, what would your suggestions be for people that are struggling to get to a place where they're having fun again? Well, I know for me, and I, it might be, it might sound a bit odd, but like I, I find I, I often live vicariously through other people's collections, uh, you know, apart from my own one. So, you know, I'm, I'm not a GI Joe guy really, and I don't have much Ghostbusters stuff. So I, I would look to other people's collections to kind of get that that fill, if you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, you, you don't have to own everything and you just you don't have to collect everything either sometimes it's okay to have what you have and then just admire sometimes what other people have and it's totally cool like and maybe you might decide that you want to have that for yourself or maybe it's just enough for you to, to look at other guys cool stuff and be like oh that's pretty cool i like looking at that um but you know if you're if you are struggling though because you did use the word struggling and I, to that i would say that if you're struggling, maybe just back off and, and take a bit of time to see if it's actually something that's, um, is it collection related that's stressing you out or that's making you struggle or is it something else? Because, you know, the last thing you want this to be is something that causes you stress or anxiety or, or anything like that. Really, right. ideally, it should be the opposite. It should be the thing that gives you the air to breathe, the space to vent. The, the time to yourself just to be with your thoughts and if that's you know taking photos of toys messing around posing toys putting them back on the shelf whatever you want to do and whether you're a vintage collector modern collector a completionist like there's no right or wrong way to do this and you know if you've more than more than one toy more than two toys is a collection you know you don't need to have a room full of toys to, to have a collection and you know at the end of the day We've all got different things going on in life. You might not have the money, you might not have the space, you might not have the time, because we do probably dedicate a lot more time than your average Joe to this hobby. You know, it, it can be quite time consuming. Um, so what I would just try to, to tell anybody is just enjoy it and take it one day at a time. Try and enjoy what you have in the here and in the now. Because uh, there's a lot of people out there who would love to have what what you got, and and like I and I'm, there's so many people now are going to watch this or listen to this, and it'll ring through for them because they're they could be thinking, oh, you know, I really want that grail piece that I don't have, and you know, and they're kind of getting upset over that. While well, there's somebody else looking at their collection, going, wow, I wish I had what he had. You know, that guy, yeah. he's so lucky to have what he has, and it can be difficult, you know, to come out of your own bubble. And, and take a step back and it was interesting earlier on jim when you kind of switched camera angles for a second we got that kind of wider view of what you look at it, it really does take it into perspective and you know maybe that's another thing for for people to possibly practice maybe when you walk into your collection room instead of just walking straight in maybe just stop at the door and actually take a moment to actually look into what you're walking into and you know, kind of take account of, of all you see before you, because chances are it's a, it's a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, when I first uh, got this, all the shelves up and I had kind of made the menagerie, kind of, I, I just kind of called it the mosaic display is what it kind of was. I would do that. I would, when I, I would be in the middle of, of a heavy drinking session with my wife. One of those nights where it's three in the morning and, you know, we're both, three sheets of the wind and you know having a great time music's blasting and but i gotta take a piss i'd take the piss no pun intended and then because the, the bathroom's right next door come out of there and i would just open the door and just stick my head in and just look and go fuck it i fucking did it 
you know, and then close the door. And I didn't have any anxiety in that moment about what was to come because phase one complete, like it's here, it's safe. I don't have to worry about it. Now the fun begins, but then life's pressures and kind of overtook things and, and snatched that away from me. And it's been a process over the last couple of months to kind of regain that hmm. uh, to where I can take a look at it and just go, wow, there's, this is really cool. Uh, I, I get that, that gratitude thing from what I call the TARDIS moment. If you've ever watched Doctor Who, every time a new companion steps into the TARDIS, they're always like, it's bigger on the inside. It's crazy. I get that with, you know, my, my stepson or my wife will bring somebody over and I'll have the door open, I'll be at the computer or whatever, and they'll kind of peek in. And it's like they know some of these things because they've seen it in their, you know, pop culture. But it's like a lot of this stuff's not readily available here. But they know who Superman is. They know who, you know, Captain Kirk is or whatever. So they'll they'll see a glimpse of color and then they'll pop their head in and it's like they don't want to disturb me it's like come on in you know and then they kind of see the shelves and they see the stuff and they're like wow and it's like yeah wow man it is kind of cool and i have you know fr fr local friends that that either don't collect as much or or collect something totally different or don't collect at all and every time they come over i'll say like hey it's different in there you want to look right ahead. <laughs> and like, you're not coming. I'm like, no, nah. because I in, invariably you'll hear the, you'll hear the door open and then you hear, oh, wow, <laughs> you know, and then they come back and they're like, that looks this. That's cool, man. You know, uh, granted, the first time anyone comes in here with one exception, there was only one exception where I didn't go in the room with them at first. Uh, but generally. The first time someone's in here, I will come in, sit here, turn, and just, and just watch them look at it. And that's like, it, it just, because again, it's not about someone envying it. It's about someone enjoying it. And yeah. for me, I think that's at least a third of why one should have something like this, is to share it with other people in some way. You know, um, at this point, I'm looking at content as an extension of that. You know, not look at what I have, but consider the possibilities. You know, there are people out there that could not be bothered to have this much stuff or that much stuff or that much stuff. Um, but we'll see one thing like for example me keeping the castle grayskull at the angle that i have it because i think dead on is boring and i want to be able to when i come from this way i want to see inside the castle right like i want to have that little hint of well there's shit in there too you know i like mark's way where he's got you know the two different camps on each side of the room and he's in the middle that's that's kind of Super a cool, cool idea you know and he and you can you can choose evil or good that day depending on what you want it's true you know I, I, and I, I love it, the experience of the little stupid sparks of inspiration, right? So yesterday, I, I well, no, two days ago, I was in here, and I was moving a bunch of stuff around. That's where Wind Raider went up and all this other stuff. And I'm posing Prince Adam in the center because I'm like, well, he belongs closer to sh the Shira castle because he, and that's more his vibe anyway. He wants to just kind of chill, right? And he, and he had the sword up, which looks cool and everything. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense. He-Man's right over there. Like, it, it, in the confines of the current version of the display, that makes no sense. So I put his arm down with the sword. And I said, well, what else could he be holding? I said, wait a second. And I w just knelt down. And I picked up a bag off the floor, pulled out something, put the bag back down, fiddle with him. So now he's holding a bottle of Corona like this. <laughs> you know, I was going to say, and, yeah. Prince Adam's more of a, you know, a, a martini kind of guy than uh, holding oh, yeah. up the power sword. <laughs> yeah, if, if it ever gets to a point where, uh, you know, like, I don't want this to happen, for example, but when the cartoon collection goes up for the She-Ra stuff and some of the, the female characters come out, um, if any of them ever end up on clearance, 
best believe I'm going to buy a bunch of them, change their clothing, and have at least one photo sesh where Adam's just in like a recliner with a beer belly just <laughs> with a bunch of chicks that he's, you know, hung out with, let's say, just kind of sleeping it off, so to speak. That'd be a fun little thing, you know, bring in some salt, sprinkle it all over the table. <laughs> just because these, these are the things I look forward to doing, like having a dedicated like I, I do still want to have a dedicated space where I can just have a little photo session and do the thing where I did have that space, but then I went and got into 3D printing. Oh, well. Um, but it'll, it'll get there. And so while I can't dedicate a physical space to making these ideas a reality yet, um, I, can, I can reserve the mental space to allow myself to be inspired and to change things. And, and, and just again have fun with it so if i have advice for people it's it's one little thing every day one little thing whether it's just changing the pose of one figure or moving that figure or just focusing on one shelf and seeing if, if there's something more you want to do with it or if you have a pile of toys to open, open one, just one, you know, and you don't have to put it anywhere. Just open it, enjoy it, set it down and then display it another day. If I would give people any advice yeah. on collecting and display, it would be forest and trees, cores, do you know, doors and corners. No, if you put all your crap on one shelf, and you just have all the stuff together, you can't see it because all you see is a, you see a wall of stuff. But if you pull everything off and you just put a few key pieces, suddenly each of those pieces come into focus. So it, it, it is a common thing I see with collectors where they want, they think I've got all these guys from this collection. They all go on this shelf. It's like, this is too much stuff, man. Mm -mm. Just take a few key pieces and put them together and then you'll really appreciate it. Yeah, let it be what it is, you know, like, um, right, like right now my, my turtle display has the Technodrome, the turtle van, a sewer playset, and a handful of figures. It's not even close to all the figures I have. I'm yeah. looking forward to putting my Foot Clan and, and Shredder and stuff up there, um, along with some other vehicles that are sitting there. Like, there's, there's things to do. But for right now, to walk in and just see all four turtles and an android Krang and the Technodrome, it's like, that tells a story right there. There's nothing else I have to do to it for it to be awesome. But when that opportunity arises, a.k.a. when I get this, this tower of figures down and I can get to the rest of my villains, you know, that's, that's going to be fun to do if I have the opportunity. So... The places where you think things are lacking, I challenge you to make it fun, to do something where it makes sense. So, for example, Largo, that missing G.I. Joe you have amongst all the others. I don't have. Take a, yeah. piece, take a piece of picture. Take, a, take a, 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 a picture or find a good headshot of them. And then in Photoshop or whatever, create a missing in action. <laughs> poster and then have one that's big enough for one of the figures to hold yeah. just have them looking at it or like put it as the background like fully MIA. Embrace it. No. yeah like why not right I like it. You know, like, like have have fun find something no matter how small a reason to justify it and if you find day after day after day after day that you just can't find that little tiny thing then just close the door and don't come back until you're ready to try it. You know what I mean? Not you or you or but, but you watching, like, like, you know, take the time away from it. Cause sometimes that's what it takes, you know, to step back. And even if new stuff is still coming in and you still want to grab stuff, that's fine. If you got to stack stuff up before you open it and get it back, like, it's okay. It's all right. You know, whatever makes sense for you, because we only get one go round on earth depending upon your belief system. 
Uh, but, but as far as this particular go around, this is only going to happen once. And there's no guarantee you're going to be in a position to have this kind of life again if reincarnation or whatever is a thing. And I'm going to reincarnate as a giant moth and I'm going to take on Japan. I, I really hope so. Um, because the longer that lore goes on, the more powerful that moth becomes and the more I like her. So Indeed. Yes. Um, but, but again, th this should be about joy and fun. Uh, now, granted, and I want to take the last few minutes of this to kind of just briefly go over this. There are collectors out there that don't collect for fun. They collect for speculation. They collect for... Um, they are collecting to be the object of envy of others. Whether they admit it or not, that's something that they're doing. And there's nothing wrong with either of those things. And if what we're saying just doesn't apply to you, that's okay. Except for scalpers. The that, that would be one exception to that. That's not okay. Well, I mean, scalpers, I think, are that's a whole other topic I think we may have to come back around to. Uh, but suffice it to say, whatever for whatever reason you're collecting, if you're collecting, whatever the reason, enjoy it for the for the purpose that you set out to do it. And if you aren't, try to help, try to figure it out. Um, and if you need help, let us know. We'll try to find a way. Um, for those that hoard to sell, because that's not collecting, eh, that's that's your thing. This is not what this is about. Um, but this is the last question, and I'll go last. What is one thing that if you had to go back in time at the beginning of the collection you currently own, and you had a chance to tell yourself something in advance. What would you tell yourself and why? Mark. Buy it now. Buy it right now. Don't hesitate because those prices are just going to go up, up, up. But this is relating specifically now to vintage collecting, of course. Um, Sometimes my mind is still uh, all the way like back in the, the early teens of like 2015, 2016 when it comes to prices because some days I'll go online to look at some vintage stuff and my eyes will practically pop out of my head when I see how expensive <laughs> stuff got. And I, I, I had one of those kind of, just one of those lives where I was constantly putting things on the long finger, especially when it came to, to buying what I wanted. I'd be like, oh, you know, I'll, the Technodrome is probably one of my most famous misfires. Like, I always put it on the long finger at the time when vintage ones were a lot more readily available and reasonably priced and in better nick in, in general that you would find. And, you know, then the years rolled on, all of a sudden the prices went up. Now, thankfully, I'll be able to hopefully pick up one of those reissues and, you know, that's that's that will be another itch to be scratched. But, yeah, look, I would probably... In a responsible fashion, I would tell my younger self to, look, if you got the money, if you're not going to, like, go hungry that day or whatever, or maybe if it's just for one day, it's okay. But, you know, just buy it. It's just going to go up in price later on. So maybe a few of those ones you were hesitating on, a few things you were a bit afraid of, ah, fuck it, go for it. You only live once, right? Exactly. What about you, Largo? What would you go back in time and tell yourself? Ready, fire, aim. That that was one of the things in my early version of this collection that I had a problem with is buying things without a plan and just because of the impulse of, oh, I want this stuff and then not planning my purchases better. So I would it, better to, you know, aim before you fire, before you pull the, the proverbial trigger on, on the purchase. Because I have some pieces that it's like, I spend a lot of money on stuff that doesn't really need to be in a collection. And then when I go through and sort the collection, put it on the shelf, they end up in a bin. And it's like, I didn't need those pieces. Why did I spend the money on those? Yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, it would be take what you're thinking about organization and think further. Think six months from now. Think five years from now. 
uh, organize things in a practical way. And by practical, I mean you need to be able to know exactly where something is. And you, if you can't find it within five minutes, you're organizing it wrong. Even if it's in a stacked bin, take the time to organize it when you get it. You will thank yourself. Because if I'd have taken the time, because I remember the realization that I had in the fall of 21, where it's like, I have to open this stuff. I can't wait. Like, this taking up too much space. So I had that four or five hour opening session. Oh, yeah. And it was, it was depressing. It was fun. And then it was depressing. It was like, oh, I got to put all this away? <laughs> no. So if I'd have just admitted that to myself, you know. Uh, it had been fine. And it had, I said, okay, up front, all right, I'm just going to bite the bullet and get a storage unit. Say, okay, um, these things arrived. Now I have to go to go to storage. So like, for example, and I, I don't want to do this too long with it, but I would have I organized better. I would have had a dedicated chair in storage. I would have had a little workstation in the storage unit to then unbox things and, and store them away there, which would have helped me in the long run because now I find myself on this. It feels like Star Trek. I'm on this glorious five year mission to get to the starting point that I wanted in the first place. Um, but that, oh yeah, and a, a label maker and or Scotch tape and a sharpie is a, a yes. good idea. <laughs> label your boxes. I have multiple label makers for that reason, but um, you know, you. I, I think all of us have that thing that we wish we could do differently. But we, the, the fact is, don't regret what you missed as far as an idea. You are where you are. And it comes back to that, like, well, you can't change the past. The future is uncertain. Decide what makes you happy today and do it. And I'll tell you what made me happy today was talking to you guys. I love them all very much. And, and this was something that I've been looking forward to from the first moment that I thought of the idea uh, a couple of weeks back now at this point. So I'm sure this is the first of many conversations that we'll have, but um, thank you both very much for your time. Um, you could find my friend Mark here at Boba Hicks on Instagram and uh, Jim Largo. Is, is it at Largo's layer now? Have you changed that or is it? I think it is at... Uh, I think it's well on Instagram. It's still uh, Jim Largo forty two. YouTube, okay. it's it's just Largo Slayer. Largo Slayer. Okay. Don't forget the Boba Joe show. Yeah, cool. yeah, Boba Joe show over on Johnny Suarez's channel. So all those links will be in the description below. Check these guys out. Give them some love. And um, hey, we will see you next time on displaying our dysfunction. And remember, a toy a day keeps the depression away. Cheers. Oh, yeah. Extra special thanks to all of our Patreon and YouTube members. The support really helps.